from our country and away from our people. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. We shall send in ever-increasing numbers ships, planes, tanks, guns. That is our purpose and our pledge. FDR's decision to make America the arsenal of democracy was another step out of isolation. He trounced Wilkie five to one in the election and saw his victory as a mandate for action. The key to it was Lend-Lease. We would provide goods, uh, the, the weapons uh, and the, uh, the economic goods which they would use to pursue the war because implied in that was the recognition which the American people came gradually to understand that we had a vital interest in the war because if Europe were completely overrun, then we would be isolated and in very bad shape. Now, composed against that was a very vociferously urged sentiment by people like Charles Lindbergh. It is now obvious that England is losing the war. I believe that... Charles Lindbergh was a leading spokesman for the America First Committee. And I have been forced to the conclusion that we cannot win this war for England, regardless of how much assistance we sent. If uh, Roosevelt had not pushed Lee Slend through Congress uh, in the spring of 1941, Britain would simply not have been able to continue to fight at all. We were dead, flat, broke. Churchill said that he thought that Lend-Lease was perhaps the most generous act ever uh, performed by one sovereign state towards another sovereign state. He was enormously moved by this act of generosity. In August, Winston Churchill was on the deck of the battleship Prince of Wales, somewhere in the North Atlantic, about to meet Franklin Roosevelt for the first time. It was the meeting the President and the Prime Minister had long anticipated. Roosevelt and Churchill were probably the two greatest prima donnas in modern world history. They each had a healthy sense of their own ability and importance, but they each was very curious about the other. But more than that, this conference was an occasion to bring together the diplomatic and possibly the military activities of the two nations, and particularly to work out the economic aid that was so important for Britain. The Atlantic Conference succeeded beyond Churchill's fondest hopes. FDR, his friend in need, became his friend indeed. It was a relationship that lasted until FDR's death. There is a French saying which I'm sure you know, that in any relationship there is always one person who kisses and the other who allows himself or herself to be kissed. Um, in that relationship, it was Churchill that did the kissing. It was Roosevelt that allowed himself to be kissed. Churchill focused upon Roosevelt as uh, the prime necessity to ensure that Britain survived. <laughs> As early as spring of 1941, after a series of British defeats, FDR had become convinced the country would eventually be drawn into the fighting. By midsummer, the United States Navy was convoying supplies across hostile waters for Britain. America was, in fact, involved in an undeclared war in the North Atlantic. What was going on in the North Atlantic, in effect, was that American naval vessels were tracking German U-boats and letting the British Navy know where those U-boats were. That was a very belligerent act on the part of FDR. We know now from British documents, which were open to historians in the 1970s, that at the Atlantic Conference, Roosevelt made clear to Churchill 
that he wanted to bring the United States into the war. He told Churchill at that meeting that all he needed was an incident or an episode for the United States to become involved in the fighting. The information was found in minutes of the British War Cabinet meetings Churchill held after the Atlantic Conference. In 1941, the war in Europe was seen as the big threat to America, not the war in Asia. But in Washington, Secretary of State Hull knew differently. He was at loggerheads with Japanese diplomats over the question of China. The United States wanted Japan to end its war against China. Japan refused. The negotiations broke down. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. John McCloy was Assistant Secretary of War. He went to the office that Sunday because he had a hunch. I didn't have the faintest idea it was going to be at Pearl Harbor, but I knew or felt that it was going to be something. So I went down early Sunday morning just to be on the deck because I'd seen the previous cables and intercepts, and something was going to happen in the Pacific. All of a sudden, uh, we realized that our whole battle fleet was destroyed in a couple of hours. The Japanese diplomatic code had been deciphered, and it was known an attack was imminent. The military code had not been broken, so the site of the attack remained a mystery. America's loss was staggering. Meanwhile, Winston Churchill and John Wynant, the American ambassador, were having dinner in England. There was an animated conversation going on around the table, and um, there was just uh, the news coming through, and it, uh, it said that uh, uh, Japanese aircraft had that morning uh, bombed the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. And there was a bit of a delayed action because Churchill and Wine were talking about that, and they both stopped talking. What did that say? Pearl Harbor. And Wine said, well, that means war. Whereupon Churchill and Wine got up and more or less danced round the room together. <laughs> I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Congress voted for war 33 minutes later. There was only one nay. The great debate was over. The isolationists were silenced. America was at war. Three days later, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. FDR will continue. Park. He took the stamps back and forth between here and the White House. His son, James, recalls that on the afternoon of the attack on Pearl Harbor, he went to the White House to find his father absorbed with his stamps. The president said to him, I'm trying to stay calm. I'm trying to remember that I must be the picture of calm. He wanted to set an example for the American people in an extreme national emergency. We'll look at the war years next. ABC News continues with a special program on Franklin Delano Roosevelt, including interviews with the four living presidents. It was in these two chairs here in the Hyde Park House that Roosevelt sat with Churchill to plan a strategy to win the war. FDR, the president, had become the commander-in-chief. In four years under FDR's leadership, the United States had become a world superpower which was quite a change for a people who never wanted to get mixed up in all those foreign wars anyway. But in the beginning, 
the outlook was not very bright. The news from the war front stunned America. After Pearl Harbor, there was one Japanese victory after another in the Pacific. For the first time in more than a century, the United States was suffering defeat at foreign hands. We are now in this war. We are all in it, all the way. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. The United States was the last hope of the free world. FDR, as its president, had to act. He faced tremendous challenges. The anti-Axis forces were in disarray, and America itself was ill-prepared. Facing the biggest crisis of his life, he turned all his energies toward coordinating the Allied effort and mobilizing the military and industrial might of the country. This production of ours in the United States must be raised far above present levels even though it will mean the dislocation of the lives and occupations of millions of our own people. We must raise our sights all along the production line. Let no man say it cannot be done. It must be done, and we have undertaken to do it. He was a man who learned by experience, who reacted to experience, uh, and he did have the essential quality of being able to persuade the people and bring them along, which was vital. And you can have a man in, uh, who might have had a much more, uh, a much wiser man in the White House in terms of his erudition and his learning. In a sense, uh, Woodrow Wilson was that. But he wasn't a leader. He wasn't a leader in the same sense. And what we needed desperately was a leader, not only for the United States, but for the world, because it was... Uh, the ability to bring Europe back, to uh, uh, have gained their confidence during the war, which could carry over into the post-war period, which was essential. In 1942, America and its allies were fighting fierce battles against the Japanese in the South Pacific, against the Italians and Germans in North Africa. Meanwhile, Russian troops were locked in battle with the Nazis from Stalingrad to Leningrad. Losing 10,000 men a day, Stalin pleaded for a second battlefront in Europe against the Germans. Roosevelt and Churchill wanted to oblige, but they needed time. A Big Three conference was called in Casablanca to explain the delay to Stalin, but Stalin refused to attend. Roosevelt and Churchill met without him. Casablanca was one of a series of conferences held by the Allied leaders to discuss both military and long-range political strategies. Roosevelt viewed these conferences as opportunities to use his political savvy and persuasive style with other leaders. Roosevelt always felt that he could do almost anything if he could just talk to somebody. He had tremendous confidence in his charm and in his knowledge of other people and their problems. So he had a natural bent toward personal diplomacy. Also, he liked people. He liked to talk to people. He liked to meet people. While in North Africa, FDR visited American soldiers fighting there, not only to boost the morale of the troops, but also to boost morale back home, where newsreels showed him as the war leader surrounded by his generals, firmly and confidently in command. At home, FDR's war efforts were in full swing. Scrap drives were organized and Americans were asked to make many sacrifices. Let put the axe to the axis. Let them know that their show is all through. Oh, let put the axe to the axis. Lend a hand to the land we love. 
through. With all our might, we'll fight, because we know we're right. And then, again, the future will be bright. So let's put the axe to the axis and finish up the trouble they began. By mid-1943, Allied forces under the command of General Eisenhower had defeated the Germans in North Africa. The Nazis were in retreat in Europe, too. The Japanese were losing ground, island by island. But the road to Allied victory would still be long with many casualties. Throughout 1943, FDR kept pressing for a meeting with Stalin. The Russian leader finally agreed to meet at Tehran in November to plan the details of the long-awaited Second Front. But Roosevelt had another purpose, establishing a personal relationship with Stalin. He believed that if peace were to be maintained after the war, Soviet cooperation was imperative. Roosevelt saw the conference as a great success. I may say that I got along fine with Marshal Stalin. He is a man who combines a tremendous, relentless determination with a stalwart good humor. I believe that he is truly representative of the heart and soul of Russia. And I believe that we are going to get along with him and the Russian people very, very well. There's no doubt that Roosevelt was ludicrously optimistic about his ability to get on with the Russians. There was an enormous element of wishful thinking in his handling of Stalin. He saw Stalin as just another political boss. Uh, and if he pressed the flesh and twisted the arm and ro lo rolled the logs and, and did all, all that, then he could manage Stalin as he managed anybody else he'd encountered in his political life. He thought he could influence Stalin charm him and get him to to uh, be more cooperative and even uh, have the system if he understood that that uh, the objectives were the same even though their methods were different that uh, we could come to a much closer understanding he was a little bit naive I would say about that he never fully understood communism or the philosophy of communism he thought of it as sort of an extension of the New Deal while FDR was planning for post-war peace, at Los Alamos, New Mexico, scientists were feverishly working on the development of an atomic bomb, a decision made by the president and one that would change the nature of war forever. The project was carried out in the utmost secrecy. I think uh, his most important piece of deception, if you want to call it that, was not telling the Russians about the progress of the atomic bomb. Of course, the Russians knew anyway, and that, in turn, led them to attack Roosevelt as himself being unwilling to share secrets with their, with the American ally, that is, Russia. I would suspect that he probably did not think through the, what a nuclear age meant. Most of Roosevelt's thinking about the A-bomb was focused on its utility in defeating Germany and Japan and not about the, uh, the uh, consequences afterwards. And probably he also engaged in the American nostalgia that our monopoly would last a lot longer. To the American people, FDR seemed to be everywhere. If not at wartime conferences, he was rallying the forces at home. I have just returned from a two weeks tour of inspection on which I saw our men being trained. We're pouring into the worldwide conflict everything that we have, our young men and the vast resources of our nation. The American people have accomplished a miracle. The miracle paid off in 1944 with the greatest invasion in military history. 300,000 Allied troops stormed the Normandy coast of France. The Second Front was finally open. Two months later, the glorious liberation of Paris. On 
the other side of the world, naval and jungle warfare were pushing back the Japanese. Riding the crest of military success, FDR went off to Hawaii to confer with General MacArthur and his other Pacific commanders. His stature as commander-in-chief and as international diplomat had never been greater. And that was just what he wanted. After all, he was campaigning for his fourth term as president. And he got it, handily defeating Thomas E. Dewey. So help me God. Roosevelt was now the most powerful man on earth, hoping to use that power to shape the world that would follow the war. He went off to one last summit conference to meet Churchill and Stalin at a health spa on the Black Sea, Yalta. What happened at the conference was to become the most controversial issue of FDR's foreign policy. This is how the war map of Europe looked when the big three met at the Yalta conference. It influenced what was decided there. Americans and British racing across liberated Belgium and France toward Germany. The Russians marching through Eastern Europe, including Poland. At the time of Yalta, Soviet troops were already deep in Poland and were certain to get deep into, uh, into Germany. And there was no effective means at that time to oppose their forward movement when the war was uh, still going on. And it was therefore highly probable that the Soviet Union would exercise an important political role in Eastern Europe. That reality was on FDR's mind when he arrived at Yalta for what was to be his last chance to achieve his post-war aims. He looked tired and haggard. Later on, it was said, his condition impaired his dealings with Stalin. But by most accounts, FDR's mind was as clear and quick as always. And at no time during the conference did he give any indication of being unable to give his full vigor, intelligence, strength to the issues before them. Roosevelt and Stalin and Churchill met for eight days. FDR was convinced he'd got what he came for. For one, Stalin promised that Russia would enter the war against the Japanese. He wanted above all at Yalta, I think, to be sure that the Russians not only would come in against Japan, but would come in early enough to take some of the brunt of the conquest of Japan, which was expected to take about a million American casualties. Stalin also agreed to keep Russia in the United Nations after the war. Roosevelt firmly believed that Soviet-American cooperation in the UN was the only way to maintain post-war peace. In addition, the big three committed to free elections and democratic governments in the Eastern European nations. Averill Harriman was at Yalta with FDR, and he remembers. At Yalta, he got Stalin to assure the independence of Eastern Europe, and three countries agreed that they should be able to hold free and unfettered elections, the people should be, and that the uh, people should have their independence. and. Uh, uh, com complete right of individual control of their country. I hope that you will pardon me for an unusual posture of sitting down during the presentation of what I want to say. I know that you will realize that it makes it a lot easier for me in not having to carry about 10 pounds of steel round on the bottom of my legs, and also because of the fact that I have just completed a 14,000-mile trip There were two main purposes in this Crimea conference. The first was to bring defeat to Germany with the greatest possible speed, with the smallest possible loss of allied men. The second purpose was to continue to build the foundation for an international accord that will bring order and security after the chaos of the war. In public, he was the idealist who assumed Eastern Europe would be free and independent outside the Soviet sphere. Privately, he knew better. After the Yalta Conference, he announced to the American Congress that the Yalta meeting meant the end of spheres of influence. But in fact, in private, he repeatedly said that spheres of influence 
were a reality of international life which the country could not do away with. The name Yalta, even today, is associated with diplomatic failure. Nothing in Roosevelt's record as a statesman has aroused more controversy, more second-guessing, than his dealings at Yalta. Critics accuse him of giving away Eastern Europe. The accusation that at Yalta we gave away East Europe implies that East Europe was ours to give away, which it simply was not. Unless uh, the West was prepared to walk straight from World War II against Germany and to World War III against the Soviet Union, we had to accept the power structure which was established by Soviet military strength. I think it's, from one point of view, unfair to blame uh, Roosevelt for what happened to Eastern Europe. Uh, one can blame him more, I think, for not realizing sooner than he did, that is, practically within days of his death, uh, that he was dealing with a man in Stalin uh, who could not be trusted. I have always believed that in the immediate post-war period after Roosevelt died, uh, a perhaps more assertive American diplomacy, uh, strangely enough, using the Yalta agreements as a basis, might have uh, prevented the establishment of satellite regimes and might have caused the Soviets to content them, themselves with establishing Finland-type situations in Eastern Europe. But that the Soviet Union would be politically dominant in Eastern Europe was inherent in, in the strategy of the war, not in the diplomacy of Yalta. And I am confident that the Congress and the American people will accept the results of this conference as the beginnings of a permanent structure of peace upon which we can begin to build under God that better world in which our children and grandchildren, yours and mine, the children and grandchildren of the whole world must live and can live. When he came to office, America was isolated, economically crippled, militarily weak. He led the way as we won a war we could have lost. Winning it quickly and with a minimum of American casualties. Our isolationism ended forever. We became a superpower, economically and militarily the strongest nation in the history of the world. FDR will continue. Military victory, also a moral victory. Evil had been crushed by the good guys, and we were the good guys, but maybe not that good. Early in the war, Roosevelt allowed the roundup of some 120,000 Japanese Americans who were put in internment camps on the West Coast. They were presumed to be traitorous and disloyal on grounds of race, while German Americans and Italian Americans, whites, never were subjected to anything like this. The ACLU calls it the worst breach of civil liberty in American history. Roosevelt also ordered wiretapping and the opening of mail for national security, he said. He did so without a court order, and the idea was to keep a close watch on aliens. Just how far the FBI went is uncertain, but there seems little doubt it was an extraordinary expression of presidential power. Recently discovered, in 1940, Roosevelt had a recording machine in the White House and a microphone at his desk. Some visiting senators had gone out and misquoted him, and he demanded accurate transcripts of what he had said. Well, there's not much in the recordings. There was talk of publicizing the fact his opponent, Wendell Wilkie, had a mistress, even though Roosevelt did too, but nothing happened. And after a few weeks, the machine was never used. Something else not related was the Holocaust. Millions of European Jews were murdered in Nazi death camps. 
Roosevelt knew something about what was going on. Lots of people did. Diplomats, journalists, Winston Churchill, Jews around the world. But mostly they didn't believe it because genocide on such a scale was incomprehensible, unprecedented, and perhaps even physically impossible. FDR was pained by what he knew about the concentration camps, but neither he nor any other Allied leader grasped the magnitude of it. And rather than diverting army forces to rescue the victims, he went ahead with the Allied strategy of winning the war as fast as possible. FDR will continue with a look at the world beyond the altar. One day, a world... The war ended in the summer of 1945. It ended in Europe when the Germans surrendered. It ended in Japan when the atomic bomb was dropped on two Japanese cities, causing the most horrible devastation. Roosevelt ordered the atomic bomb built, but did not live to see it used. Well, now, with Peter Jennings, we will turn again to our four presidents and ask them what has happened in foreign policy since and because of what Roosevelt foresaw. We have seen our civilization in deadly peril. Successfully, we have met the challenge. We owe it to our posterity. We owe it to our heritage of freedom. We owe it to our God to devote the rest of our lives and all of our capabilities to the building of a solid, durable structure of world peace. It's been 37 years since the end of World War II. They have not brought the peace which FDR had prayed for. The United Nations, which he helped create, was intended to stand on the rock of unity between the great powers. The greatest division in the post-war world has been that between the two greatest powers, once allies in the war against Hitler. FDR had wanted a world in which the United States and the Soviet Union would cooperate. As the American delegation left Yalta, there was genuine hope. Not long after the war, those hopes began to disintegrate. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. As the West saw it, the Russians betrayed agreements made at Yalta. There were no free elections in Poland. There were to be none anywhere in Eastern Europe. As Stalin saw it, Yalta and the Soviet war effort had made Eastern Europe a Soviet sphere of influence in which Moscow would have the final say. Soviet domination, very often by force of arms, has been a major source of continuing East-West tension. FDR's successors have been unable to stop the Soviets whenever they decided to crush even limited experiments with democracy. It is ironic. In the winter of 1981, the independent Polish Union was suppressed in part for trying to implement those free elections agreed at Yalta 37 years ago. Did FDR give away too much at Yalta? While most historians conclude he did not, among FDR's living successors, there continue to be different assessments. They literally turned over Eastern Europe to the Soviet Union as a sphere of influence and interest. But they did insist on provisions of the things that uh, Stalin had agreed that he would do. Churchill, as we know, took a different viewpoint uh, from Roosevelt. Churchill was, uh, saw Stalin's uh, uh, vulnerabilities or what have you uh, long before others did. Uh, but uh, he was unable to convince Roosevelt on that. And he said that he was shocked by Roosevelt's appearance. Uh, he said he was not himself. Uh, he, w he said if, had he been well, the whole course of history would have been different. I think we gave away too much at Yalta. Whether a more adamant position by Churchill and Roosevelt could have prevailed, I really do not know. But uh, if there was a serious mistake made by Roosevelt in the conduct of foreign affairs, it was being too generous to uh, Stalin. Do you think at Yalta he really had any choice? Realistically, uh, he probably didn't. 
from a negotiator's point of view, it would have been uh, pretty much impossible to get Stalin to move all those Russian troops uh, out of those occupied areas. Eight presidents since FDR have negotiated with the Soviet government. There have only been fleeting embraces. The American perception of Soviet behavior has always been conditioned by the lingering suspicion they could not be trusted. Do you think the Russians can be trusted to keep an agreement now? Well, let me say, knowing their philosophy, that morality is that which furthers socialism, that I would not believe that any of the negotiations, for example, in arms reductions that we're engaged in uh, should be concluded without provision for verification for both sides to make sure that each side is eliminating the weapons that it has promised to eliminate. In uh, most of the cases, I believe they have uh, kept their word. Uh, in others, they have shaded their actions. They're always pushing to the, to the deadline, so to speak, to uh, go beyond it, go beyond what they have agreed to. They're, they're aggressive. They uh, are seeking to do what they believe is in their best interest. Uh, we have to be tough in the negotiations, but we have to be just as tough in insisting that they live up to whatever they have previously agreed to. You made probably the most serious effort of any president since Roosevelt to work out some kind of accommodation with the Soviet Union. Do you think it is possible now? I, I think that what we have to realize is that there is a way to deal with the Russians. Now, they may be wrong, and they may be evil, and all that sort of thing, and I have made that case. But on the other hand, they are not stupid. And they do not want to destroy themselves and destroy the world. They want the world, but they do not want war. Because after war, the world wouldn't be worth having. I would talk to them. I would try to negotiate limitations of nuclear arms. I would certainly trade with them on the right kind of a basis, and also to influence them by simply pointing out that if they misbehave by attempting to uh, expand their influence over areas that are vital to us, that we have ways to react. At the end of World War II, FDR left the United States tall and strong amid the ashes. Only the U.S. and the Soviet Union could really lay claim to being global powers. World conflict since then has been shaped by their competing interests. The American reaction to the Soviet Union has caused the United States to expand its military commitments far beyond what FDR thought they should be. We must take immediate and resolute action. In 1947 came the Truman Doctrine. The United States drew firm lines around the Western world and declared that Soviet influence should go no further. Should we fail to aid Greece and Turkey in this fateful hour, the effect will be far-reaching to the West as well as to the East. The Cold War had begun. A year later, a Soviet-sponsored coup in Czechoslovakia finalized Soviet domination of Eastern Europe by then, FDR's policy of cooperation had given way to containment of what America perceived to be Soviet expansion, what the Russians still see today as a policy of American encirclement. American-Soviet relations since then have been a vicious circle of mutual suspicion. For every president since FDR, anti-communism has been a central factor in his foreign policy. Wherever communism was perceived to be active, the United States moved to meet it. Communist activity in Asia, especially the Korean War, in which the North was supported by Moscow and Peking, led the United States in search of Asian anti-communist allies. In the late 1950s, in the name of anti-communism, the Eisenhower Doctrine was an attempt to defend Western interests in the Middle East. American troops and military aid were offered to virtually anyone who said they were resisting international communism. Let every nation know. John F. Kennedy maintained the policy, 
Minutes after becoming president, he told the world how far the United States would go to implement it. That we shall pay any price, bear any burden, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. By the mid-60s, the U.S. was something of a godfather and had military alliances with 42 other nations. And then there was Vietnam. For the communist aggressors to win in Vietnam, they would know that they can accomplish through so-called wars of national liberation what they could not accomplish through naked aggression in Korea. The United States believed it was helping resist Soviet and Chinese expansion. The Vietnamese communists had been fighting since before the Second World War to rid themselves of foreign domination. They saw the United States as just another imperial power. Ironically, perhaps, Roosevelt was committed to the notion that colonies like Vietnam should be allowed to rule themselves. Vietnam is the only war the United States has ever lost. The failure in Vietnam led to the most critical re-examination of American global responsibility since FDR's death. Our power is not unlimited, as the Vietnam experience uh, tends to, to indicate. Uh, but on the other hand, as we look at the situations in the Persian Gulf, in Africa, which has all of the mineral resources and so forth, so essential to our friends in Europe and Japan, as well as ourselves and all the industrial countries, we have got to see to it uh, that our mineral resources and our oil resources are not cut off. That is what I, what I think is the great foreign policy uh, challenge for the United States in this period. The war that we are likely to lose is one that we're not going to fight. It will be in this third world area, which the Soviet is going after very effectively. In the world since FDR, events have tended more and more to escape the will of the Oval Office. For one thing, American economic power has declined. Before the end of World War II, the United States was largely self-sufficient in natural resources. But now some emerging nations control the oil and other resources the West needs to survive. They have a power they never had before to hold the American economy hostage. The rising demand of developing nations to share either the world's resources or political power has played havoc with presidential policy. The actions of some, both rich and poor, pose the possibility of worldwide economic chaos and even war. American military power has not declined, although the dangers of using it have increased and American influence alone is not always enough. President Carter faced a rising tide of Islamic nationalism Iran held his diplomats hostage for 444 days. Trying to maintain Roosevelt's image of an American-inspired world order is now virtually impossible. The Iranian revolution, the capture of our hostages, uh, was an event that uh, I think controlled me instead of the other way around. I had to protect our nation's uh, interest and its integrity and try to bring those hostages home safely. It was an ever-present concern of mine, and I felt very frustrated at my own uh, impotence in accomplishing that rapidly. On the other hand, there were things where I felt we could control events. Uh, we had a great influence uh, in uh, extending America's uh, relationships with the emerging countries of the world and trying to enhance human rights and bringing Sadat and Begin together to uh, form the first step toward a comprehensive Mideast peace. In a time of crisis, a president has much greater control of events. And uh, when there's no crisis uh, imminent, uh, partisanship intrudes and the president's uh, influence becomes less. Well, I don't think you control uh, all events. I think you can control some things, but you can't control the events that have happened in Poland. You can't control uh, the some of the things in the Middle East, but even there, you can make up your mind that you're going to do your utmost uh, to help find a solution. Well, I suppose the major event of, of my presidency uh, 
particularly in the uh, first term, uh, was, of course, the war in Vietnam. Now, I could not control that event, but I think one of our major achievements is that despite the fact that we did have the war, that at that time we still did were able to go forward on some foreign policy initiatives. The China initiative we undertook and did not allow the war totally uh, to obsess us so that we didn't go forward in other areas. It's very important that a president not allow the event of the moment uh, to blind his vision of the future. The years since FDR have been darkened above all else by the shadow of nuclear weapons. When Franklin Roosevelt died, the bomb that was to end the war and change the world had not even been tested. Well, the bomb, of course, is, has, has changed foreign policy altogether. Uh, there was a time when war, or the threat of war, could be justified as an instrument of national policy. I don't think that. I think that time is gone now. Uh, if it's rather an empty threat uh, to say we're going to start a nuclear war uh, if, uh, unless you quit doing something which we don't like someplace in the world. It's horrifying. There would be no escape if it happened. And uh, I have to say, in my own mind and in this position, I'm going to do everything I can to see if we cannot reduce, if not totally eliminate, those weapons to the point that the world no longer will have to live under the threat of incineration. But while nuclear weapons have become the most powerful restraining influence on the superpowers, the nuclear club has expanded and other nations further threaten the world's stability by being on the nuclear threshold. We live today in a more dangerous world, more so because of the nuclear weapons which Roosevelt commissioned. On the day before he died, Roosevelt wrote a speech containing advice more relevant now than when it was written. Today, he wrote, science has brought all the quarters of the globe so close together that it is impossible to isolate them from one another. Today, wrote FDR, we are faced with the preeminent fact that if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relations, the ability of all people, of all kinds, to live together and work together in the same world at peace. FDR, a final note in a moment. He was there when the country was in danger, first at home and then abroad, and he dealt with both. Not perfectly by any means, the war left Eastern Europe in trouble, as it still is, and the new government role he created has now become so expensive that people cannot afford it. But that happened after he died, and it goes on the records of those in office since Roosevelt and those of us who elected them. His legacy was a changed country in a changed world. Because his influence still lives, Franklin Roosevelt is himself still a part of our living history. And when he was our president, it was almost impossible for those who knew him to imagine that he would ever not be president. The poet, Archibald MacLeish, who wrote for FDR, recalls the last time he saw him alive and realized that his life was nearly over. It was twilight. He was facing what little light there was. And he looked up and looked at the window, and I've never seen such anguish in the human face. And it suddenly came over me. It had not come over me once prior to that time. It suddenly came over me that he was going to die. And that afternoon hour was in my mind when, when the news came. A press association has just announced that President Roosevelt is dead. The president died of a cerebral hemorrhage. All we know so far is that the president died at Warm Springs in Georgia.
wrapped in black crepe and are muffled as you can hear. And the pace of the musicians is so slow. Behind them, these are Navy boys. And now just coming past the treasury, I can see the horses drawing the case on. And most generally, folks having as tough a time as I am. And behind us is the car bearing the men on whose shoulders now falls the terrific burdens and responsibilities that were handled so well by the men to whose body we're paying our last respects now. God bless them. We return you now to the studio. The people stood there and cried. I did too. It was, it was a great sorrow because part of the country was dying too. I mean, part of the country that one wanted to keep alive.